Good afternoon, everybody. Please could you take your seats? I'd like to introduce you to Matthew Short, who is going to give a very interesting talk on um, mostly to do with chocolate, I believe, Matthew. Chocolate, don't Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank things. you. Here we go. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. So this is my chalk, uh, chalk, or even a talk, possibly. Donuts and chocolate, a fairer way to do business in Madagascar. Let's see if I can work this slide machine. There we go. So I'm wearing three hats today. Firstly, I'm a Chippenham town councillor. Secondly, you will have seen me on the Zero Chippenham stand, possibly, um, where I helped do the solar scheme. But today I'm going to talk about the chocolate journey that <coughs> I've taken over the last 17 years with my wonderful wife, Diana, who was cheering at the back. Yay! So, talking about Diana, back in the early 2000s, um, my wife Diana was a wonderful creative force. She'd taken her moped down the coast of France. She was a Madanari, a street painter. Um, her moped got stolen in Nice, and so she ended up staying there for six years, where she worked her way up as a chef to, um, to be a head chef, running a group of French chefs there. And then she moved back to England and worked in Michelin star restaurants. Even back in 2004, got to cook for Sir David Attenborough at the Wild Screen Awards and create the menu there. And then one fateful day, we watched one of these programs, how to uh, pay off your mortgage in two years. And I don't know if you remember those kind of things. And they had this thing where chocolate is a great thing to get into. So we moved to Chippenham and we turned our home kitchen into um, a chocolate kitchen. And I can assure you, you don't pay your mortgage off in two years, in case you're wondering. <laughs> Go the right way on this. And like a lot of businesses, we started off making chocolate from home. I was an engineer at the time. I went part-time. We were selling on market stalls. We went to Allington Farm Shop, the local farm shop, and said, do you think you could sell these chocolates? And they were really good, and we had a relationship for 17 years where they carried on selling for us. And then as time went on, I rapidly think over the next two years, we started winning awards. Um, and getting noticed, and one day we went to um, Waitrose Country Living Awards, which was in pouring down with rain um, in burly horse trials, and we, we didn't have Wellington boots like everybody else, or hunters, and the uh, managing director of Waitrose at the time, Mark Price, said, you're all the best food producers in the country, and we're going to get you all of you into a Waitrose store, and we were great, yeah, this is fantastic. And then the buyer, the food hall buyer, leaned over us, to us on the table and said, actually, you work from home and it's a bit of a no-no. And so we were deflated, but then we thought, right, okay, we need to get premises. Oh, wrong slide. So I gave up my job as an engineer. Uh, we put together a business plan, um, and we took it around every bank in Chippenham who all said, you've got the best business plan we've ever seen, but actually we don't want to give you any money. So um, we ended up remortgaging our house, and we set up a small chocolate unit in Corsham. We opened a shop in Sirencester, and you can see um, Jay Rayner filming for the one show here. And we'd taken a huge financial risk with our mortgage, so we wanted to grow our business. That was our focus. It was all about growth. And then over the next few years, we got noticed by Liberty and Selfridges, and we were, we were stopped by all of them, and we were working like mad in uh, oh, Christmas markets and pop-up shops and all of these things. And, but actually, life wasn't actually that brilliant. It was exciting, but it was stressing our children out, particularly um, our oldest son, Harry, was getting into trouble at school when we got busy. And so we thought, okay, we need to um, actually change our life a, bit, a little bit here. Maybe growing our business isn't everything. There were also huge problems with chocolate supply. We started off um, intuitively, always felt it was better to somehow buy chocolate that was made in the country of origin. We didn't have the figures as to why that was, but it felt right. And we started off with Venezuela, um, and then a huge political situation happened there, and those disappeared overnight. Then we went to the Grenadian Chocolate Company. Um, sadly, their founder electrocuted himself in his own machinery, so um, just all sorts of problems in chocolate supply chains. And so we were looking about 2013 for a new sustainable chocolate supply, and I went to a conference in London, and I happened to meet this wonderful guy, a guy named Neil Kelsall. A bit like me, Neil was a former engineer. He worked for Philips, and he traveled the world. Um, and he'd come to the conclusion, he saw immense poverty in some of the places he'd worked, and he felt that the best way to help people was to help them 
to help themselves. And he, he came up with um, a business model. It was initially called Equitrade, and then it went on to be called Raise Trade. And he went into South Africa, and he took um, wine. And rather than exporting a commodity product, he would get them to bottle wine and label it and export a finished product. He did it with cashew nuts in Mozambique, and also with coffee, getting them to, rather than just exporting coffee beans to actually have a finished branded product. But his real pièce de résistance was chocolate. He'd started working with a small Malagasy chocolate company called um, Chocolaterie Robert, and initially he tried a um, chocolate to retail model. So he tried exporting bars to the UK, and that was going okay, it was going great. Um, got a lot of press attention, the um, Guardian called it the fairest, world's fairest chocolate, um, 50 great ideas for the 21st century, but Malag Madagascar had huge um, political problems at the time, and it just, it just failed, the model failed. So in 2013, he was trying to relaunch it, and this time he went for a business-to-business -business model. Um, and it just so happens that we were sat next to him looking for a new chocolate supplier, and that started off our, um, our journey. I do actually have some chocolate, actually. I don't know if you've had any um, passed around yet. You have, eh? It may contain nuts. Cashew nut definitely does. So if any of you keel over, um, apologies about that. It's, um, <laughs> hopefully you won't. So this model um, shows you a typical chocolate bar comparison. So this is 100%. And if you look at the bottom here, the cocoa farmers typically get maybe 5%, 4 to 8% value of a chocolate bar. It's very low. It's a commodity crop, mostly manufactured in Europe and turned into a, um, a finished product. If you add fair trade, this is this green line, fair trade is great, but it still only adds about 1.5% in the country of origin in terms of value, so it's, um, it's not really addressing the main problem. If, however, you can transfer that manufacturing part into the country of origin, then suddenly you retain about a third of the profits, you have all those extra jobs of um, you know, manufacture, and you retain tax revenues, and if you could even sell the bars in the country of origin, you retain 100% of the value there. And there is actually in Madagascar a very small local um, chocolate industry. So, a little bit about Madagascar. It's the world's second largest island country. It's got a population of about 30 million. Really young population, actually, that's grown rapidly. It broke off from the supercontinent of Gondwana about 90 million years ago. And you can see it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle piece that, that fits into Mozambique. Has consequently, as I'm sure you know from David Attenborough, it has unique biodiversity. Lemurs being the um, poster child, but also um, uh, endangered now. First humans arrived about 1,500 years ago by canoe from Africa and um, Indonesia. And it was a French colony from 1897 to 1960s, and that's where, you, as you can guess, the chocolate influence comes in. Unfortunately, 90% of the original forest has been lost due to um, a slash and burn agriculture called Hatsaki, where they raise bits of the forest, plant, and then after a couple of years it becomes infertile. There was actually a really good BBC um, article a couple of years ago about a young girl who'd, who'd got her school to start composting. Um, and they, just a simple thing like that wasn't, wasn't even um, aware of. Lots of political corruption um, in Madagascar. Um, and last year, you may have heard, they had what was called the UN's first climate-induced um, migration. This picture here, the top one, is taken in the Ambanja region. It's, it's in the northwest. It's quite near the cocoa-growing regions in the San Barano Valley. And we were lucky enough to do that whole trail in 2016. And what we saw there was that everything grows in that region of Madagascar. It's lush, it's green, it's wonderful. And whilst there was lots of poverty, as you can see, the children seemed happy. They all went to school. There was plenty of food for most of the time. The bottom picture is taken in the capital in Antananarivo. This is in the center of Madagascar. It's at an elevated level. And most of the um, migrants from the south have gravitated towards the capital city, as they often do. These boys here are making um, footballs out of plastic bags. So it's a good example of the circular economy, maybe. But um, there was lots of poverty there. Um, climate change is expected to disproportionately affect farmers. Many of them are um, uh, female-led 
smallholder households. Um, and again, you can see the contrast here. The top picture is from the um, plantations in the San Brano Valley. They have zebu, which are the natural um, native cattle. They don't have any dairy herds in Madagascar. And these are um, bananas, which are used as a shade tree um, for cacao, which is a very um, delicate crop and traditionally would grow um, in rainforest, uh, shaded by the rainforest. And in the bottom here, you can see in the capital again, this guy's pulling a huge number of oil barrels on, its, um, on his back. The, the contrast was really uh, quite stark. So these, these are the cacao trees. They're brightly colored pods. This is up in the San Brano Valley. Um, they grow all year round, and the, the, the seeds of the pod are the cocoa beans or cacao beans, and that's what we make chocolate from planted by the French and the Portuguese back in the sort of early part of the 19th century. Uh, and you can see my wonderful wife Diana here by the entrance to the San Bruno Valley. And in the bottom here, you can see the chocolate factory, Chocolaterie Ribeir. So this was built by the French in the 1940s. Um, and it was really the only sign of industry we saw in the, in the capital, actually. It was really uh, um, quite stark. So, this is, in this picture, if you look here, so when you actually cut the pods open with a machete and break off this white mucilage, you can see the beans. And when the beans are fresh and you cut them open, these violet ones on the left, these are called forastero. So this is about 85% of the world's chocolate is made from forastero beans. They're a bulk variety. They're really um, disease resistant, so they're planted in West Africa a lot. They don't taste great. Um, Hershey's, Cabris, Nestle, Tony Chocolonely, all of those brands would, would be made with Forastero um, beans. The white beans, these are the holy grail for an artisan chocolatier. These are Criollo. About 5% of the world's chocolate is Criollo, if that, if there are any pure varieties left. Really fine flavored, um, but not disease resistant, doesn't grow well. And then the interesting thing, if you look over the pod on the far right, you can see that it's actually got both varieties of beans in there. Cocoa um, flowers are naturally pollinated by a small midge, which they don't have in Madagascar, but they did have a very suave French agronomist who they put in place called Thomas um, to try and rejuvenate the plantation. And he believed that the ants were cross-pollinating the trees. So they've got a 10-year program where they're picking the um, pods with the finest flavor, uh, and the highest yield, and then replanting those seeds. And in Madagascar, it takes about five years for a new tree to grow. Um, and then they're going to have to harvest those, try them, taste them, see how it flavor, the flavor goes. And um, so it's a 10-year program. Um, normally, in West Africa, it would take 10 years for a tree to, to grow. So this is the factory in the capital. This is uh, the Chocolatry Robert team. We've got Harry, Zhu, um, Nicholas on the end, and I can't remember the other lady's name. But the thing that really um, was pleasing, that they're wholly Malagasy owned, they have um, equitable employment in, in terms of gender, um, and it really did do the things that we thought in terms of um, bringing employment to the capital. So, that was the chocolate part so far. Where does the donut come in? If you just come in, I have got some chocolate if you want to uh, try some. You got some, have you? Okay. So this is, the, this is the boring bit, so I'll go through this quickly. This is donut economics, so... It's not boring to me, actually, but it's... Uh... So I guess all of you know, if you watch the TV at night, you read the newspapers, everything, everything's about growth, isn't it? The, we must grow the economy. Growth is good. We wake up, we get born, we grow onwards and upwards. It's, everything is about growth all the time. But is that really what makes life worth living? Is that, is that what the economy is for? Um, so GDP, or um, gross domestic product, actually first came about after the uh, Great Depression in uh, the last century, um, put forward by Simon Kuznets, a great economist. Um, and then in the Second World War, it came to measure military spending as well. And what we've got here is a graph of um, GDP per person per capita that's been normalized for different spending parities. And you can have a look. So at the bottom left here, oh, and the, the y-axis is the social progress index. So this is kind of a measure of 53 things that actually say what makes life worth living. Health, education, welfare, rights to um, association, all of those things. And you can see that at the bottom we've got Central African Republic, Afghanistan, 
Madagascar is right down there, 500 US dollars per um, GDP. And then up at the top, we've got the Scandinavian countries, uh, Norway, Sweden, UK even. And I guess the thing it shows you that as you grow an economy, in the early days of the economy, you get great benefits in schools and education and health and welfare. But then if you're in a developed nation, it kind of levels off and you can end up in this kind of ever decreasing circle of pursuing growth without actually maybe improving the things that make life worth living. Sustainable development goals, I don't know, I'm sure many of you here have heard of those for 2030. I first heard of these from a Colombian um, chocolatier called Sergio Restrepo, who um, had a fantastic program where they'd taken a cattle ranch and reforested it into agroforestry. His family got kidnapped um, about 20 years ago by the um, cocaine um, sort of um, dealers, and, and he was really turning them away from cocaine and back to um, cocoa, which was Simon Ree featured it on uh, one of his documentaries. Um, and we based part of our business around the sustainable development goals. Then we come to the donut part. Um, so this donut economics, Kate Rayworth, there's a brilliant bookstore downstairs selling donut economics. So if you want to buy a copy, go and get one. And essentially it's a picture. If you look on the inner side of the circle here, you can see the things that form the social foundation, health, welfare, water, food, education, all the things that make life prosper. And then on the outside of the donut, we've got the planetary boundaries, because the one thing that's, of course, happened this century, and why we're all here, is that we're starting to exceed those ecological and climate limits. So these are things like air pollution, climate change, and the idea is that we need to evolve our economy to stay in the safe place where we prosper and don't exceed planetary boundaries. So how did that happen with chocolate? So firstly, it sounds wonderful, it sounds easy to do, but to actually do it in practice is quite hard. So Kate um, Rayworth set up a thing called the Donor Economics Action Network, or Action Lab, which you can join as individuals, companies, even cities have joined, Amsterdam, Barcelona have, uh, are um, there. There are some councils, Cornwall Council, use um, Donor Economics, and we joined as um, a business. And there are a number of tools you can use. So on the left here, the University of Leeds have got a comparison tool. So the left one here is UK, right one is Madagascar. And is, this was taken about three years ago before lockdown, before cost of living crisis, so things might have changed. But essentially the UK is doing pretty well on social foundation. Some people might argue about that. But we're exceeding our ecological footprint, our climate footprint, our phosphorus runoff into our rivers. Contrast that with Madagascar. The only thing they're really exceeding their footprint is of change of land use. Um, and that's um, illegal hardwood logging goes on on the East Coast, goes via free ports in Singapore into China. Um, we, we were sort of met the British ambassador there and he told us of this um, things. They've got loads of gems and jewels and minerals and everybody wants a piece of Madagascar. Um, so they have huge problems on that front. On the social foundation, they're not doing so great either. They're one of the world's poorest countries. There's no social um, care. Um, education is paid for. Um, they do have nearly full employment, but if you look at income, it's pretty low, so they have lots of very low-paid jobs, and that's kind of where raised trade comes in. So back to chocolate. So vegan chocolate. So back in 2018, we were looking for a vegan chocolate. Um, it's a bit of a generalization, but most, most people when they're younger prefer a sweeter chocolate, a milk chocolate equivalent. And when you get older, your taste buds change a bit and you go to the dark side. So we were trying to find a milk chocolate equivalent. Um, in Madagascar, um, they don't have any dairy herds, so when they make milk chocolate, they had to import milk powder from New Zealand. So it was made it quite expensive um, and was one of the reasons we didn't use their milk chocolate. So we were looking for a really good milk chocolate equivalent, um, and we tried loads of them, and they're mostly made with rice milk, and they taste like cardboard at the time, so not particularly good. Um, and our friend from Chocolate Madagascar, um, Nicholas, started to tell us about an experimental chocolate they were doing. So back in uh, 1999, there was a degraded region called the Masaloka Great Lake region, which was quite close to the plantations in the San Bruno Valley. And it was even considered sterile. And the, the WWF had put in a program where they did an agroforestry plantation of cashew nuts. Very small region. Uh, this guy, as you can see, doesn't look particularly happy in uh, the picture, but he's, he's guarding his plantation carefully there. 
And it was a scheme where they were trying to create an employment sink, um, you know, schools, education. They gave rice to the uh, um, employees each month. Um, they had identity cards so they could check their um, age and make sure that they were um, no child labor. So it was a really good scheme. And I don't know if you know much about cashew nuts, but they're incredibly difficult to process. They're, they're really hard. They've got a caustic sort of oil that um, burns your hand on the outside. And this is the processing plant they have there. As you can see, it's very tiny and very manual. Um, and the consequence of that was that the um, cashew milk chocolate is very expensive, even for a small chocolatier um, like ourselves. And we had a wonderful sort of full circle thing where Nicholas managed to get a visa. It was incredibly difficult. It took him about nine months. He was their export manager. He's the guy on the, the right there. And got his visa, showed us the cashew milk chocolate, and it was just what we were looking for. And um, we made it into vegan salted caramels in different bars and got it into John Lewis. Um, and it, it really completed the circle. We were also able to take Nicholas when he came here around the Roman baths. And... Um, I don't know if you've been there, where they had these actors who were in character, and this, this lady at the bottom is saying to Nicholas, so what, what do you do then? And Nicholas said, uh, chalk, chocolate. And she said, what is this chocolate? Is this some, some building material from Rome that I haven't heard of? And, and Nicholas was completely befuddled by this, but it's it very good. So I've done a pretty whistle-stop tour in this talk, actually. It took 40 minutes when I did it at home, and I've done it in 20. Um, but the final word on growth should perhaps go to Robert Kennedy was a U.S. senator in 1968, shortly before he was um, assassinated, sadly. And he, it's a famous quote where he says, the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our wisdom or, or our learning, our compassion or our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short set which makes life worthwhile and um, there's a charity we work with when we went over there in 2016 um, a children's home uh, there's no social care and Nicholas's wife Hanta was a social worker and they've been given a, um, a home by the church there um, which they turned into a children's home for um, girls that the police could um, had nowhere to take essentially you know often people are so poor that they their children are, are put to work or um, you know, hard labor sometimes, or, or on vanilla plantations. And this is Dia Volina on the right. She's just completed her second year at university, which we're um, really proud of. And fortunately, university is a lot cheaper in Madagascar than it is in the UK. So um, that was one thing we found of. And that's her friend, Tantley. And she's um, gone through school. She was an absolute star. And um, yeah, now she's um, had work placement at the chocolate factory. So. Thank you, that's essentially it. And I whizzed through that and missed out loads of stuff. But um, yeah, anybody got any questions or uh, anything? Or have I just blasted you with information? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Claire. Oh, hi, Claire. If we were to do it all again, it's been interesting because I'm. Um, so we did actually close our business at Christmas, I should say. So I'm not here sort of promoting our own business because we're not selling anything now. Um, in order to sell the business, we would have probably put a team in place. But one of the things we found is as we went from quite a big company of about 20 people at one point down to a small one, we became friends with our, um, our staff became our friends. And it, that was very very different. So when we all finished together, it kind of felt right. So, so I suppose there's no continuity in the business. That would have been nice to, um, to have happened. Um, it's easy in hindsight, isn't it? I mean, in the early days, we were making things in plastic globes and, and all of those things and just weren't aware. Um, and then as we became more aware, we got rid of plastic and we, you know, we, we went plastic free and um, ended up being a sort of net zero company as well so I don't think I would have done anything differently really it was a great I think we changed it early enough you know that we uh, did it maybe not listen to the don't pay pay your mortgage off in two years program but um <laughs> Sorry. 
If anybody's interested, because I haven't really explained donut economics, but there's this great book by Kate Rayworth. There's a TED talk if you don't want to um, read the book. They're selling them downstairs, I notice, next to the Zero Chippenham stand. And there's another great economist called Tim Jackson, who wrote a book called Prosperity Without Growth back in 2009. And he's already got an amazing TED talk, and he wrote a follow up post growth. Um, and it's a fascinating read. It really makes you think, you know, about the economy and what life's worth. What lies for? Pete. Hi. <laughs> I know everybody here pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Well, in the early years, I mean, I say back into, because uh, we used to do Christmas markets, and people would always say, oh, you're going to go on Dragon's Den, aren't you, next? And I'd go, well, actually, actually no, because we don't want to expand. We don't want investment. And it would feel a bit awkward. It would feel like I was apologizing for that. And they were just making conversation, you know, but it sort of killed the conversation dead a bit. Um, and then as I started to research and read all of these books, and, and, and I kind of came to the conclusion that actually what we were intuitively doing had you know had real good science and evidence behind it you know that, that um, I mean of course we need to grow the economy now probably because we've got such a huge national debt um, coming up to 100 percent of GDP that I guess you need to make that shrink that debt down so we're stuck in a bit of a trap um, and also I think Theresa not Theresa May um, Liz Truss showed us last year that you can't make even you know sudden changes to the economy because you can destabilize it so I think it's an evolution. Um, we need to do. Um, yeah, some businesses, I think, I think now in the last, when we first went to Byers, when we, used, we went to John Lewis um, in 2017, and we came back from Madagascar, and we saw the sort of coral reefs were, um, it was an El Nino year, and the coral reefs were bleaching, and we, it really changed our life in the way we thought about things. And we said, right, we're going plastic free, that's, that's the next step. And we showed them to John Lewis as a buyer, and they said, well, it's wonderful, but you can't see the product. And if you can't see the product, people don't want to want to buy it and we preferred the plastic version you know um, so but now of course everybody wants to be plastic free so it's a, we were kind of ahead of the game really yeah well thank you all thank you all for coming I think I know most people here um, and I'll be on the zero chip and him stand if you've got any sort of questions or anything or whatever thanks Wonderful, and everybody's still, still, nobody's had any allergic reactions, so that's good.